Well, this is going to be part nine of the reading and commentary on Lars Fischer's uh, study and book on the socialist response to anti-Semitism in the imperial German state, that is during the Second International and the discussion that preceded the formation of the Third International, from which the discussion on anti-Semitism spilled over. Okay. And here we shall go. There it is. What all these anti judeophobic in effect, arguments have in common is that the only work of one that acknowledges the core of the anti Semites' accusations in the first place. The Jews really are like the anti-Semites say they are. They really do play the role the anti-Semites ascribe to them. It was not the anti-Semites' analysis that was wrong. It was the inferences they drew from their essentially correct analysis that were at fault. That was the prevailing sort of opinion in the Second International. Clearly then, people did all, did to all intents and purposes see anti-Semitism as a direct product of the socio-economic circumstances. Quote, were anti-Semitism really no more than the product of catchphrases, the result of the work of certain activists, unquote, he explained, quote, we would not need to deal with it, agreement from the floor of the Second International Congress, that is. And the current movement as it actually exists, would be unthinkable. Here, here, they say. To dismiss anti-Semitism with such a claim would move on the very same plane on which our opponents believed for decades that they could rebuff us. Here, here. After all, while the underlying sentiments were obviously older, it was, quote, only with the year 1877 that this movement gain publicity as a political phenomenon, says Babel. How did this come about? It was the natural effect and consequence of the economic conditions brought upon us in Germany by the great crash of 1874. Here, here. Now, there can be absolutely no doubt that the Jews, he says, I add that when I speak of Jews, I am always focusing on the majority of Jews, stood at the forefront of our economic development once they had attained equality in all respects, unquote. It had been claimed, he went on, that the recent election results were remarkable in that, quote, the anti-Semitic movement found such fertile ground precisely where there are so relatively few Jews, unquote, namely in Saxony. But, quote, Given the current organization of society, it is not decisive where the Jew is personally in town. Crucial is whether and how he is perceptible as a competitor. As such, however, he is perceptible everywhere. Unquote. This remark epitomizes the fundamental ambiguity of Babel's entire line of argument. Is, quote, the Jew supposedly perceptible everywhere as a competitor? because his competition can genuinely be experienced everywhere in an empirically verifiable sense of the word? Or is Babel simply taking it for granted that even people who are not personally involved with Jews cannot encounter their own specific social reality on the ground without also encountering the objective role that the Jew plays in society as a whole? Assuming Babel was in fact implying the latter, as I would argue, it is hard not to sense a disquieting affinity here to the second part of Sir Judenfrage. In any case, since the prescriptions of the anti-Semites would soon prove futile, their movement was doomed, and quote, as soon as the anti-Semitic movement reaches rock bottom in its tour, it's, it, it is our tour. <laughs> Then the hour of our harvest will come. Oh, yeah. It's like the Communist Party saying, first Hitler, then us. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The anti-Semitic movement is, quote, in its struggle for power, 
will be compelled in spite of itself to overshoot its mark, unquote. This trend was already evident, for instance, in Alward's case. Alward did, had, quote, entered the fray arm in arm with the Yonker establishment and was elected. Gradually, however, the mood of the bulk of his voters has compelled him to issue the slogan against Jews and Junker, Juncker. As soon as the point is reached where it will no longer suffice for the anti-Semites, mainly to proceed against the Jews, and they are compelled to turn on capitalism in general, and the struggle against the Jewish capitalists will automatically hold them there, oh yeah, then the movement will also have arrived where our notions can and will fall on fertile ground. We will then win the following as we will yet seek to gain in vain. Agreement from the floor. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Easy, easy, smeasy. <clears throat> okay, drink of water here coming up. <clears throat> the libelous antics of the anti Semite Hermann Alwart. 1846-1914, and the legal proceedings they embroiled him in between 1891 and 1894 clearly marked the high point of social democratic ambiguity vis-a-vis -vis the anti-Semitic movement. This went so far, in fact, that even the otherwise indubitable and categorical party political opposition to party political anti-Semitism crumbled momentarily. Alwart initially got himself in prison for four months by libeling Leichwolder, when he subsequently libeled the Jewish-owned armament supplier Low in his infamous Judenflicken, he narrowly escaped renewed imprisonment by successfully contesting the Reichstag mandate for the Pomeranian constituency of Answalde Friedenberg in a by-election in November 1892. He has returned again in the regular elections the following year, in which the anti-Semites generally fared rather well, gaining 3.4% of the vote and returning no less than 16 deputies. Alwart was, in fact, to remain in the Reichstag until he, too, fell prey to the general meltdown of parliamentary party political anti-Semitism in 1903. Once elected, he sought to exploit as best he could the publicity the Reichstag offered and his immunity as a deputy to intensify his denunciatory campaign against alleged Jewish competition and abuse, thus getting himself into ever more trouble. Oh, sorry, alleged Jewish corruption and abuse, thus getting himself into ever more trouble. He commanded considerable popular support, many identifying with him as one of us who dared to speak out against them up there. Undaunted by the persecution to which the establishment subjected him, many social democrats interpreted this anti authoritarian impulse as a clear indication of anti Semitism's increasing tendency, in spite of itself, to overshoot its mark and turn on capitalism in general. Oh, yeah, this is what the popular supporters of Trump and the libertarians is all about. Okay, we continue. Mehring, too, was vociferous in propagating this notion, embellishing it with vicious anti philosemitic remarks. Consequently, he also took issue with the attempts of the liberals to see Alwart ostracized within the Reichstag. Oh, to Mehring's mind, it went without saying that social democracy could only maintain a strict reticence in the midst of this parliamentary Alwart racket. Avakil Kraken. Krakel. He has as little to do with the anti-Semitic monk as it has to do with the capitalist rabbi. Yet occasionally he did worry about the party's response to Alwart Krakel. Your letter again roused my vehement regret. Mehring wrote to Kautsky on the 20th of March, 1893. 
And he says that you and the Nyazai aren't here in Berlin. If so, we could do so much more good than we are hopefully already doing. Particularly in Alwart and the Hautmann business, to use these shorthand terms for brevity's sake, the course being pursued here is not quite right thanks to Frau Natalie and her Jewish blood. Mehring then added, following a logic that neither requires nor deserves any comment, good old Liebnik is far too much of a philosemite, and if Frank Schoen too is embroiled in the bourgeois discourse. Generally speaking, he reiterated, reiterated on the 1st of May, 1893, in another letter to Kautsky. I do not think that the party has been and is operating in quite the right way as far as the Altwart business is concerned. Liars, as the anti-Semitic leaders are, social democracy has no reason to have a go at the anti-Semitic masses. At the moment, the assault is being launched in too far one-sided a manner on the anti-Semites, to the delight of the capitalists. One may tear its program to shreds and brandish its leaders as harshly as possible, but one should also point out the genuinely guilty party, capitalist liberalism. <clears throat> that was Marion Tukowski. And yet the differences within the party and how best to deal with Alwart cannot have been all that substantial. Mehring had already conceded in his letter to Kautsky on the 20th of March that Scheunlank had brought matters back on track in the Bauwerts. I don't generally like him, and I am, of course, hardly pleased that it was Schoenlank who rectified the matter, especially since he had taken part of his material from Mehring's publication, Capital and Press. But I nonetheless have to acknowledge that he got the Vorwärts off the hook in this instance. Vorwärts means forward. In fact, as early as June 1892, Mehring had already felt compelled to praise the Vorwärts in this respect. Clearly, then, Mehring's evaluation of Alwart was to all intents and purposes identical to that of Bibel and fully in keeping with the official party line. We might note, once again, though, that here too, Beiring distinguished very clearly between the anti-Semitic activists themselves, on the one hand, and the masses who were, supposedly, being duped by these activists, on the other. As we saw earlier, this distinction was not always maintained with equal clarity by other leading social democrats. Okay, break time for me. Okay, getting back to work here now. We'll continue with the reading of Lars Fischer's <clears throat> Socialist Response to Antisemitism in the German Imperial State uh, during the Second International. And we continue. Yet, Babel and his fellow Social Democrats, in fact, did rather more than just articulate their interpretation of Alwart's role and significance in articles or speeches. Quote, I repeatedly negotiated with uh, Alward these last few days, unquote. Babel wrote to Engels on the 18th of April, 1893, in a letter that seems to have received little attention in the literature. <clears throat> Quote, the man displays an ignorance and ineptitude that surprised me, unquote, he continued. Even though I assumed I already knew him well enough, he still hasn't submitted the motion approved by the president that I prepared for him yesterday. His own people do not know what he's going to do. The man is a twerp, which is connected to his excessive drinking. The six gentlemen in the Reichstag are split into three or four factions. It has generally been noted that not one of them has taken the word on the usury law. We will throw that at them. Babel concluded. When the third reading is open, there is nothing more they can do about it. 
Blumenberg, in his edition of the correspondence between Engels and Babel, provided two notes for this passage. One concerns the final point, which presents us with yet another variation on the anti-Judeophobic theme of denouncing anti-Semites by masking them as disingenuous. In this case, the anti-Judeophobic indictment ran as follows. You claim to oppose Jewish usury, but are nowhere to be seen or heard when constraints on usury are actually being legislated. In the event, the anti-Semites Lieberman von Sonnenberg, a Brockel, did in fact speak during the third reading of the amendment to the usury law. Thus, Babel's plan to criticize their lack of involvement on that occasion was thwarted. More importantly, though, <clears throat> Blumenberg also explained the background to Babel's negotiations with Alwart. Alwart, according to Babel, had leveled accusations against members of the Bundestag, Bundesrat, and the Reichstag in the Reichstag on the 18th and 21st of March and asked for the documentation that he wished to present to the Reichstag to be examined. Since the uh, organized anti-Semitic parliamentary group did not have the requisite 15 members, the Social Democrats provided the necessary votes. This surely is truly remarkable. Whether the Social Democrats in the Reichstag supported Alwart or any of his democratic colleagues in this way on other occasions too, I cannot say. Even if this was a one-off though, it none, nevertheless illustrates rather dramatically just how seriously Babel and his associates took their claims about the supposedly inevitable course the anti-Semitic movement would run, that it would be compelled to become revolutionary in spite of itself and with necessity, and therefore objectively plays into our hands. Presumably, Babel and his peers thought they could hasten this process by offering Alwart the sort of support rendered in this instance. <clears throat> Babel's speech in Cologne clearly did portray anti-Semitic sentiments as an obvious and reasonable, though short-sighted and ultimately futile, response to specifically Jewish phenomena. Oh, oh, I see Jewish people created anti-Semitism. Hmm. Is that so? Why are we... Uh... But that is not all. Oh, no. Vistrich, as we saw, counted Babel among those who rarely, if at all, mentioned der Judenfrage and certainly never justified it. Yet he also admitted that Babel's speech deployed terms reminiscent of the young Marx and even echoed the Marxian phrase that money was the secular god of the Jews. Oh, really? <clears throat> on closer inspection, the literature turns out to be little confused on this particular issue. For elsewhere, Vistrich himself noted that Babel had not merely echoed, but actually repeated the stock formula of Marx about money being the secular god of the Jews, unquote. Lucian Sapel, on the other hand, argues that Babel expressly rejected the the use to which Mehring was inclined to put this stock formula. She quotes Babel in a manner that might well suggest to the reader that Babel was not citing that stock formula himself, but in fact referring critically to an instance in which Mehring had done so. So what are we to assume? Did Babel's formulations merely echo Marx's phraseology from Zer Jugendfrage? Did he actually quote from it, or did he distance himself from it? As we will see, Babel most certainly did not distance himself from Zer Jugendfrage. The answer to the other question, however, whether his speech merely echoed or actually quoted from Zer Jugendfrage, will differ depending on the version of the speech we are referring to because the text exists in more than one version. It was printed, firstly, in the minutes of the Party Congress, secondly, as a separate pamphlet in 1894, and a slightly revised version of that pamphlet 
thirdly, was reissued in 1906. If we turn to the version in the minutes, we indeed find only echoes of the Jugendfrage and terms reminiscent of the young Marx. If we turn to the version published separately as a pamphlet, a somewhat different picture emerges. Why are the two versions different in this way? When the motion calling for the separate publication of Babel's speech as a pamphlet was tabled at the Congress in Cologne, Babel quickly pointed out that the speech would have to be revised for this purpose. In the process of this revision, Babel, in fact, changed relatively little. One alteration that obviously did strike him as important, though, was the transformation of the reminiscences and echoes of Zer Judenfrage that had already been discernible in the speech, and when he held it at the Congress, into a direct reference. In the pamphlet version, Babel inserted a short section claiming that just what he, Babel, was saying, Marx had expressed. In a, in a text from the 40s, Hubert de Judenfrage as follows, what is the secular basis of Judaism? Practical need, self-interest. What is the worldly religion of the Jew? Huckstering. What is his worldly God? Money. Very well then, Babel says. <clears throat> Emancipation from huckstering and money, consequently from practical real Jewry or Judaism, would be the self-emancipation of our time. Oh, oh, so Jewish people have to emancipate ourselves from something that we don't do. In the final analysis, the emancipation of the Jews is the emancipation of mankind from Jewry or Judaism. What he is saying then is, our entire society consists of huckstering and striving for money and is hence a Jewish society. Oh, that's what he's calling capitalism now, a Jewish society. Mm -hmm. When Babel reissued his speech in 1906, he went even further, really. Whereas in the initial version, he described modern society, he described modern society simply as Jewish, Yiddish. In 1906, he used the term verjudit, Judaized, instead. In so doing, he finally <clears throat> erased the last remnant of conceptual ambiguity. This was a term straight from the unambiguous vocabulary of the anti-Semites. It was a term that could never be neutral let alone have a positive connotation, not even in theory. It described a form of contamination and made it quite clear that the problem at hand was not one that society had with itself, but one that it had with an alien entity in its midst. It is therefore little wonder that Babel concluded by summing up Marx's argument as follows. With the demise of bourgeois society, the particular nature of the Jew, too, will disappear. <clears throat> In Marx's original formulation, it remained ambiguous whether he envisioned the emancipation of society from its Jews or its own Jewish characteristics. This is an issue we will take up again later. In Babel's paraphrase, this <clears throat> ambiguity had gone, the focus had shifted from the emancipation of the Jews and non-Jews alike to the disappearance of the Jews. What Marx envisioned as the emancipation of society as a whole, Babel could only express negatively as the demise of bourgeois society. What he would express in positive terms, though, was the promise that Jewry would disappear as a distinct entity. It is against this background, I would argue, that we need to interpret Babel's position. <clears throat> Take, for instance, he already cited statement that given the current organization of society, it is not decisive whether the Jew is personally in town, crucial, is whether and how he is perceptible as a competitor. As such, however, he is perceptible everywhere." Unquote. This contention needs to be understood in conjunction with the claim that 
quote, our society, our entire society is verjudit. When we take the two together, the interpretation I suggested earlier becomes all the more compelling. Empirically, empirical verifiability in any meaningful sense of the word was not Babel's frame of reference when he spoke of the una, uh, ubiquitous perceptibility of the Jew. <clears throat> Clearly, that for Babel's Judenfrage remains an obvious and important source to turn to when it came to lending his speech additional authoritative clout. Rather tellingly, when he did so, while not even being able to remember the title correctly, he automatically turned to the second part of Zer Judenfrage, and the passage that caught his fancy there was one of the most notorious of those easily understandable quote -unquote, passages the Social de Democrat had warned back in 1881 against taking out of context because they could otherwise suggest the exact opposite of what Marx had intended to say, which, in an important sense, was exactly what now happened. Babel's interpretation may not have amounted to the exact opposite of Marx's stance, but it was certainly worlds remu removed from it. In this respect, Babel's use of this passage is paradigmatic for the use to which their Judenfrage was generally put by those leading social democrats who did draw on it. Okay. Break time. Okay, let's continue for a while and return to the cesspool of the Second International. Be polite about it. Okay. <clears throat> now, Laos Fisher continues here with his study on the socialist response to anti Semitism in the German imperial state during the period of the Second International. And we go to a section labeled anti-Semitism, philo-Semitism, which is a form of anti-Semitism, and false consciousness. Oh, now we're getting into some phenomenology. As we have already seen, explaining the serious notions underlying especially the second part of the Serie is a rather murky business, since it invariably requires us to rationalize and thus by implication, to gloss over its portrayal of the Jews, <clears throat> period. This portrayal is malicious and spiteful and grounded in traditional forms of stereotyping. That Marx deployed these stereotypes just demonstrates not only his indifference to empirical knowledge, but also genuine contempt for the Jews. This contempt clearly reflects both a disturbing narrow-mindedness in the first place and a perplexing refusal to widen his horizons. <laughs> in other words, this contempt not only resulted from, but also imposed conceptual constraints on him. Nor can there be any doubt that it overdetermined the central ideas that Marx developed in Zer Judenfrage. Yet one would nevertheless be hard-pressed to demonstrate that it actually determined his line of thought or diverted it from the path <clears throat> it would most likely have taken if only Marx had nurtured a more rational attitude towards Jewry. One notion basic to the whole argument developed in Zer Judenfrage that we need to understand at this point is the following idea, which lent heavily on Feuerbach, Religious consciousness, and ideology more generally, is essentially a projection whose purpose it is to compensate for the inequities of life as it transpires in reality. The religious notions prevalent in a social group are basically a reflection, albeit ordinarily a distorted reflection, 
of that social group's inability to allow all its members to fulfill their potential in a mutually beneficial manner. To grossly oversimplify the matter, religion promises what the social group cannot afford its members. Tell me how your social group fails to offer its members a decent and gratifying life, and I will tell you what your religion aspires to. It is this connection between religion and social reality that the critique of religion allows us to recognize. However, and it is at this point that Marx shed his young Hegelian and Feuerbachian eggshells in order to change the world for the better. One obviously has to tackle the actual problems of society. No critique of religion as the distorted reflection of those problems, however radical, will actually resolve them. The boot is on the other foot. It is the actual resolution of those problems that will render religion obsolete. Ah. Time for a break. Okay, this is part nine. It's going to be the last segment for for part nine. And then we move into the uh, Vanguard Circle of the Jewish Socialist Bund uh, this evening for Shabbos. Tomorrow will be Convergence Forum. And on Sunday, we will have the Here and Now with Steve Struggle and Ahmed of Palestine. Okay, here we go. I will share. Okay. Okay, the discussion on religion as such. Within this scheme of things, differing forms of religious consciousness must obviously reflect differing social realities that are deficient in different ways. Judaism differs from Christianity, not because Jews and Christians stubbornly cling to partially differing texts and traditions. Rather, the differences between their religious practices indicate that their religions are compensating for differing social conditions and constraints. Until a fundamental revolutionary transformation rendered religion obsolete altogether, it would always be the social conditions and constraints that form religious consciousness and not vice versa. Hence, the religious particularity of the Jews was at root a reflection of their social particularity. They had played a prominent role in the money economy at a time when it was still fairly marginal to society as a whole. Hence, their religious consciousness was as marginal to society as the money economy and seemed as peculiar and unsettling to society as the money economy. As the money economy became increasingly integral to society as a whole, the religious consciousness it had previously generated in the Jews was also becoming integral to society as a whole, be it in an expressly religious or a more secularized ideological guise. Only comprehensive social emancipation could render the need for this form of consciousness obsolete for Jews and non-Jews alike. It is, in a sense, that, quote, the social emancipation of the Jews, unquote, as opposed to their merely formal or political emancipation, would signal, quote, the emancipation of society from Judaism or Jewry, unquote. It is impossible to grasp this without carefully reading both parts of Zerjudenfraga in conjunction. One need not accept Marx's notion as valid or desirable to conceive that it is worlds removed from the way in which Babel understood this particular easily understandable passage that he chose to quote from Sri Judenfraga to lend additional authority to his speech. Marx concluded that the comprehensive social emancipation of the Jews presupposed the comprehensive emancipation of society as a whole. For this reason, it would signal the obsolescence of the conditions and constraints that had once generated their particular religious consciousness, and now fettered Jews and non-Jews alike. Babel's emphasis, by contrast, 
lay simply on the fact that the demise of bourgeois society would also herald the disappearance of the particular nature of the Jew. Unquote. Babel believed in this scenario, and we need to take his confidence at face value. He was enlisting Marx's far-reaching vision in Zer Judenfrage to underscore an extremely simple message. Your accusations against the Jews are right, but if you really want to, rid of, to get rid of them, you'll need to trawl more deeply. There is a gaping chasm, then, between Marx's vision and the rather more sturdy and uncouth form in which leading social democrats tended to represent it when they did refer back to Zer Judenfrage. One explanation for this chasm is presumably the simple fact that Marx wrote Zer Judenfrage in an attempt to address what he thought of as the Jewish question, while Babel and his peers were groping for a response to anti-Semitism. There were two distinct questions here, and the Social Democrats were treating what was a problematic but complex answer to one of them as if it could equally well be used to address the other. Little wonder that its interesting core was finally obliterated in the process and only the stench remained. As we have already seen, for Marx, the Jewish question was in fact two questions. One could be answered unconditionally by granting Jews the formal or political emancipation to which they were indubitably entitled. The other, uh, the other hinged on the same problems that non-Jews too would need to surmount in order to gain comprehensive social and human emancipation. Hence, its solution presupposed a more complex process. It was this differentiation that both allowed and compelled Marx to insist on the disjunction of emancipation and assimilation, and reject Bauer's conflation of right and morality. In this context, there was a strong discrepancy between the way in which social democrats perceived of Jews, or philo-Semites, on the one hand, and anti-Semites on the other. Jews who stood on their dignity rather than giving their utmost to securing a form of general emancipation that rendered their Jewish existence obsolete were portrayed as willfully setting themselves against the inevitable course of history. Yeah, the Jewish uh, people were called an unnation at one point. Who, who was it that did that? Yes, I think it was either Lenin or Stalin. Uh, against the inevitable course of history, yes. This criticism clearly did not, did conflate right and morality. Antisemitism, on the other hand, was seen in large part as a product of the objective conditions. No, it's not the anti-Semites' fault. Aha, uh -huh, I didn't get that. Anti-Semites could not simply abjure their anti-Semitism. Why not? Because only a change in the objective conditions that could compel them finally to transcend the cryptic anti-capitalism of their anti-Semitism and substitute a fully-fledged socialist anti-capitalism for it. In fact, the prevalent assumptions, assumption seemed to have been that one ultimately had to subscribe to the Marxist scheme of things to recognize anti-Semitism's futility, even on its own terms, not to mention the fact that it might be politically morally wrong. In theoretical or conceptual terms, let's see here. In theoretical or conceptual terms, this is not quite as far-fetched far -fetched a contention, contention as it might seem at first sight. After all, within the scheme of things explained earlier, what one could indeed argue that anti-Semitism is like any other form of religious or ideological consciousness. It cannot be rendered obsolete without first radically transforming the social conditions and constraints of which it is a distorted reflection. Now, this touches on complex issues where there are no straightforward answers and the contentions at hand are not simply right or wrong. At stake here are the fundamental dialectics that govern the relationship between structural determinism and human agency within the Marxian mode of analysis. Probably the most famous proof text for this issue is Marx's remark at the beginning of the first section of the 18th Pumier of Louis Napoleon, 
first published in 1852. Both men make their own history, Marx wrote there. And he continued, but they do not make it as they please, not under the circumstances chosen by themselves, but under extent circumstances directly given and handed down to them. This remark is not prone to feel as stale as all proof texts almost invariably do when they have been excessively belabored over long stretches of time and with decreasing determination. Not only the ability to act on reality is quite literally conditioned by the circumstances, though, the way in which we see and think about reality too is conditioned in this way. Engels touched on this issue in a much cited letter written to none other than Franz Mehring on the 14th of July, 1893. Ideology is a process, Engels explained there, which the ostensible thinker indeed undertakes consciously, but based on a false consciousness. The motives that really drive him remain unknown to him, otherwise the process would not be an ideological one." Unquote. The adherents of historical materialism indeed denied that ideological developments could transpire independently of the material environment. Yet that by no means implied, Engels hastened to add, that, quote, we would also deny them any historical impact, unquote. This was a fundamental misunderstanding on the part of their critics. The point here is this, our outlook on the world and the way in which we chose in which we choose to position ourselves within it are not either entirely determined by the circumstances or entirely the outgrowth, outgrowth of our ability to transcend and radically change those circumstances. We're always looking at some sort of balance, however tenuous, between the two. Okay, that's page 84. That's enough for now. So this is uh, part nine.